tonight's meeting, we've got uh, John McLean, who's uh, going to talk to us all about the golden age of Islamic astronomy. So, John, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay. And if everybody else can turn their webcams off for me, please. I'll mute everybody for a second, then unmute you, John. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, yes, I can. Have you got a, just a slide? Yeah, just a slide. Excellent. Uh, uh, Hold on, John. I'm just going to mute I'm everybody. To I'm just going to mute everybody, and then I'll yeah. unmute you again. Okay, John, are you unmuted? Okay, right. So we're ready to go then. Well, thank you very okay. much for having. Thank you very much, uh, John, for this talk. Um, I, I normally do these talks on cruise ships, believe it or not, uh, to quite big audiences sometimes, and uh, there are lots of different subjects to do with astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology. But one I do in the Middle East is quite popular, which is this one, the Islamic Golden Age. Now, astronomy may be the oldest natural science in the world, but before humans ever took to systematically studying the skies, we were, of course, craning our necks upwards, observing the curious movements of some bright points of light and the, and the stillness of others. Civilizations around the world have incorporated astronomical observations into everything from their architecture to their storytelling. And while the pinnacle of science is the most commonly thought to have happened during the Renaissance, it actually began a thousand years and 5,000 miles to the east. Now around the sixth century AD, Europe entered what's known as the Dark Ages. And this period of time from around 500 AD until the 13th century witnessed the suppression of intellectual thought and scholarship around the continent because it was seen as a, a conflict to the religious views of the church. During this time, the written word was scarce and research and observations became dormant. A religious dogma basically overcame reason and the world of knowledge was dark. Now, while Europe was in this intellectual coma, the Islamic empire, which stretched from Moorish Spain to Egypt and even China, was entering what we call their golden age. Astronomy was of particular interest to Islamic scholars in, in Iran and Iraq. And until this time around 800 AD, the only astronomical textbook was uh, Ptolemy's Almagest, which was written around 100 AD in Greece. Now this venerable text is still used as a main reference for ancient astronomy and academia to this day. But that in those days, Muslim scholars waited 700 years for this fundamental Greek text to be translated into Arabic. And once it was, they got to work understanding and correcting its contents, which surprises many people. Now, during the medieval period, scientists in the Islamic world made many contributions to the field of astronomy. Uh, while their work was based on ancient sources from Greece, Iran, and India, they updated methods for measuring and calculating the movement of these, and they continued to develop models of the universe and the movements of the planets within it. Between the 8th and 10th centuries, Baghdad was a major center of study under the Abbasid caliphs Al-Mansur and Al-Mahmun. But local rulers across the region in Cairo, Arai, Isfahan and other cities also supported scientific research. Their support wasn't just financial, but also gave the studies prestige. And of course, it gave them prestige as well. Now, followers of Islam studied astronomy for two main reasons. The first was purely religious and practical. Muslims need to know the direction to the Kaaba shrine in Mecca in order to pray. And without compasses or GPS in those days, they relied on the sun, the moon and stars to point them in the right direction. And even to this day, uh, Muslims still uh, use various methods to find the direction to the Kaaba shrine. Secondly, they used what we now call folk astronomy, which was a bit like astrology. <clears throat> One of the most famous folk astronomers was the Islamic astrologer, Jafar ibn Muhammad Abu Mashar al-Balki. And he lived from 1805 to eight, sorry, 805 to 886. 
Uh, he was also known as Abu Mashar, which is probably just as well, the prince of astrologers. Now, in Abu Mashar's time, contemplating the meaning of stars' movements and how they impacted future human events was actually a valid and empirical practice. Later, during the Golden Age, Islamic astronomers would begin to enter into what we now refer to as astronomical research, and they made many discoveries, as we'll come to see. Now, in religion, a meteorite from a comet became enshrined as one of the most venerated objects in all of Islam. The Kaaba shrine in Mecca displays the black stone, which is said to have been found by the Prophet Muhammad, who kissed the stone. Now, today, Muslims travel many, many miles to kiss the black meteorite. It's, uh, and it's, it looks, it's, it's not huge, but it's a quite an impressive meteorite. But known as the Bayat al-Hikmah in Arabic, the House of Wisdom was then founded in the 8th century in Baghdad by Caliph al-Mahmun of the Abbasid dynasty. The Abbasid dynasty were very influential in astronomy and supported many, many astronomers during their time. The House of Wisdom came into being as a, a library or a translation institute and was an academy of scholars from across the empire. Uh, it was, began as a project to protect knowledge, including philosophy, astronomy, science, mathematics, and literature. But it quickly became, and it still is considered today, a symbol of the merging and expansion of intellectual traditions from across different cultures and nations. The library grew to become the flower of the Islamic Golden Age, which was, a, as I said, was a period between the 7th and 13th centuries. It's a time of great intellectual growth and discovery in the Islamic world. It was here that many prominent Islamic astronomers and mathem mathematicians studied. Now, at this time, the scientists translated studies in Sanskrit, Pahlavi, and Greek into Arabic. And for the first time, they recorded Arab Bedouin traditions. The Indian Sanskrit and the Persian Pahlavi sources taught medieval astronomers methods for calculating the position of heavenly bodies and for creating tables. Uh, that's very, very important. And I'll come to that and expand on that a little bit later on. And these tables recorded the movement of the sun, the planets, the, uh, and the moon, of course. And the Bedouin traditions contained knowledge on the fixed stars, the passage of the sun, and the moon through the zodiacal signs and lunar mansions. They also uh, noticed the seasons and recorded the times of the seasons and associated phenomenon. This body of knowledge was refined in part because of the specific requirements of Islam. The religion required the ability to correctly determine the time and direction of Mecca for prayer, and also the moment of sunrise and sunset for fasting during Ramadan, and for fixing the appearance of the moon that marked the start of a new month. Now, to this day, these festivals, such as Ramadan, are, are uh, guided and set on the astronomical times. Now, this led to, of course, the refinement of scientific instruments uh, and also an improvement in methods for making observations and the creation of new calendrical systems. Astrology now seeks to predict the influence of the heavenly bodies on events on Earth, relying on an understanding of the movement of the planets and the ability to calculate their positions in the future. In this way, astrology was considered a branch of astronomy. And serious scientists such as Abu Mashar al-Balki, al-Biruni, and Nasser al-Din al-Tusi all wrote astrological treaties. The number of medieval theologians and jurists and philosophers who wrote anti-astrology tracts, however, indicates that this was quite controversial and not universally accepted as a scientific or ethical practice, um, much the same as today. Many believed it was against the tenet of Islam to suggest that forces other than God could determine human events. Now, Muslims' first introduction to computational astronomy was through a thing called the Zijis. Now, a zij is a combination of tables consisting of observational data about the motion and the position of the planets, the sun, the moon, and certain fixed stars. And the coordinates of the points of intersection of major circles in the celestial sphere enabled astronomers and astrologers to make their astronomical calculations and predictions. The term is derived from the Middle Persian word zik or zig, meaning cord, that's C-O-R-D for those that don't understand my weird Scottish accent. 
The first zijis produced uh, in the Islamic period were based on the Indo-Persian tradition, and they rely, relied heavily on work done in those regions. In the time between Ptolemy in the second century CE and Copernicus in the 16th century, the majority of developments in observational and theoretical astronomy took place from North Africa to Central Asia during late antiquity, and then pre-Islamic and finally Islamic societies. The main advances happened between the 9th and the mid 15th centuries. During this period, Muslim scholars familiarized themselves with Indo-Persian astronomical traditions. They mastered Ptolemaic planetary models, improved computational and observational techniques, and they also established large scale observatories. They devised accurate observational instruments, and finally, they developed several non Ptolemaic planetary models to make the observed motions of the planets more compatible with Aristotle's cosmology. Now, one of the first directors of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad in the early 9th century was an outstanding Persian mathematician called Muhammad al Khwarizmi. Now, he oversaw the translation of the major Greek and Indian mathematical astronomy works into Arab Arabic, and he produced the uh, original work which had a lasting influence. Uh, and on the advance of Muslim and later European mathematics. And of course, I'm sure you, you can guess why. al khwarizmi Zij al Sindhind is a work consisting of approximately 37 chapters on calendrical and astronomical calculations and 116 tables with calendrical, astronomical, and astrological data, as well as a table of sign values. This is the first of many Arabic sijis based on the Indian astronomical methods known as the Sindhind or the Sindhind. The work contains tables for the movements of the sun, the moon and five planets known at the time. This work marked the turning point in Islamic astronomy. The word algorithm is derived from the Latinization of his name and the word algebra is derived from the Latinization of al Jabr, part of the title of his most famous book in which he introduced the fundamental algebraic methods and techniques for solving equations. Perhaps his most important contribution to mathematics was his strong advocacy of the Hindu numerical system, which al Khwarizmi recognized as having the power and efficiency needed to revolutionize Islamic and Western mathematics. The Hindu numerals one to nine, and importantly, zero, which have since become known as Hindu Arabic numerals, were soon adopted by the entire Islamic world. Remembering that, that, of course, before this point and before the Hindu numerals were used, there was no concept of zero, which we find a bit strange today. Now, often called the Ptolemy of the Arabs, al Batani is another terrific Islamic astronomer. He was born in Haran around 858 AD, and he's perhaps the greatest and best known astronomer of the medieval uh, Islamic world. Al Batani made remarkably accurate astronomical observations at Antioch and Al Raqqa in Syria. He composed work on astronomy with tables containing his own observations of the sun and the moon and a more accurate description of their motions. Than the, and it was much more accurate than that given in Ptolemy's Almagest. Later, even Copernicus used Al Batini's calculations in his controversial book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. In fact, al Batani is the only Islamic astronomer Copernicus actually names, although he used previous work of many others, including Al-Tusi. The main achievements of al Batani are he catalogued 489 stars. He refined the existing values for the length of the year, which he gave remarkably as 365 days, 5 hours, 46 minutes and 24 seconds and also of the, he redefined the values for the seasons. He also used trigonometry to make his calculations, which improved on the method that had been used previously by the Greeks. His work improved greatly on the ideas and calculations of Ptolemy. Remember Ptolemy, uh, his ideas had lasted for thousands of years. Now, Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi was one of the nine famous Muslim astronomers. His name uh, also implies that he was from a Sufi Muslim background, and he lived in the court of Emir Adud Ad-Duala in Isfahan, Persia. 
and he worked on translating and expanding Greek astronomical works, especially the Almagest of Ptolemy. Until this point, until the, these translations, remember that uh, Islamic astronomers relied purely on their own observations and they waited a very long time, as I said, 700 years to, to uh, actually get their hands on the Almagest and get it translated. And he contributed several corrections to Ptole Ptolemy's star list. And he did this uh, using his own brightness and magnitude estimates, which frequently deviated from those in Ptolemy's work. Uh, he also identified the Large Magellanic Cloud, a galaxy region in the Southern Hemisphere, which is visible from Yemen, but it wasn't vi visible from Isfahan. So this is, this is quite strange. We're not quite sure how Al-Sufi managed to see the Large Magellanic Cloud. Obviously, he must have traveled to a region, but there's no record of him traveling to any of the regions where he could see uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And it wasn't seen by Europeans until Magellan's voyage in the 16th century. However, Al-Sufi seemed to see it from where he was. Now, the next person I want to talk about is Ibn Yunus. In the Book of the Fixed Stars, Al-Sufi combined Ptolemy's work of mapping constellations with Arabic astron astronomical traditions. And uh, along with uh, Ibn Yunus later, later on uh, in uh, 950 AD, who expanded on this work, uh, uh, Al-Sufi wrote around 1964, uh, 1964, 964, the book that contains extensive illustrations of each constellation from both the terrestrial perspective, that's looking up from the earth, and the inverse, as the constellations would look from outside the sphere of the fixed stars. Just imagine that for a moment. This was a man who, with very limited uh, experience, very limited knowledge, was able to imagine what the constellations looked like from space. That's quite incredible. Now, Al Sufi's drawing became the canonical representations of those constellations. And in Europe, his works were translated and widely circulated. And even today, we use many of the star names that he recorded in the book. Vega, Aldebaran, Betelgeuse, and many more, of course. The Book of Fixed Stars documented more constellations and more stars in those constellations than ever before. And these included some of the first recordings of what we would later understand to be another galaxy, Andromeda. Now, as I mentioned, Ibn Yunus from 950 AD, he built again on the work that uh, previous Islamic astronomers had done. And he also found uh, faults in Ptolemy's calculations. Uh, Ibn Yunus was from Egypt, the same as Ptolemy, and uh, he looked at the movement of the planets and their eccentricities. Now, Ptolemy was trying to find an explanation for how those bodies orbited in the sky, including how the Earth moved within these parameters. Ptolemy calculated that the orbit of the Earth, or the precession as we know it, varied one degree every 100 years. But Ibn Yunus found that Ptolemy was, in fact, quite wrong, and that, in fact, it was one degree every 70 years. However, what they didn't know was that it was the Earth's wobble causing this change because in the 10th century, it was still believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe. This discovery by Ibn Yunus, however, and others like uh, Ibn al-Shatir changed the landscape of astronomy forever. And there, eventually the heliocentric model was proposed by Copernicus in the 16th century. And this definitely built upon the work of Ibn Yunus, Al-Tusi and various others. Now our knowledge of instruments used by Muslim astronomers primarily comes from two sources. First, the remaining instruments in private and museum collections today. And second, the treaties and manuscripts preserved from the Middle Ages. Muslim astronomers of the Golden Age made many improvements to instruments already in use before their time, such as adding new scales or details. However, some of the instruments in use were incredibly accurate for the time. Celestial globes were used primarily for solving problems in celestial astronomy. Today, 126 such instruments still remain worldwide, the oldest being from the 11th century. The altitude of the sun or the right ascension and declination of stars could be calculated with these by inputting the location of the observer on the meridian ring of the globe. And our millinery sphere had similar applications. 
No early Islamic or military sphere survive, unfortunately, but several treaties on the instrument with the rings were written. Uh, this image you're seeing now, this armillary, is in my garden in Exeter, and uh, I like it very much. Now, we've all heard of astrolabes, and brass astrolabes were a, were a Hellenistic or Greek invention. The first Islamic astronomer reported as having built an astrolabe is Muhammad al-Fazari in the late 8th century. Astrolabes were popular in the Islamic world during the Golden Age, chiefly as an aid to finding the Qibla, the direction to Mecca. The earliest known example is dated to 927 AD, although a few exist from later periods. The instruments themselves were used to read the time of the rise of the sun and fix stars. And Al, -Al Zarqali of Andalusia constructed one such instrument which, unlike its predecessors, didn't depend on the latitude of the observer and therefore could be used anywhere, which was obviously extremely handy for Muslims who were traveling to Mecca. So wherever they were, they could work out the direction they needed to go. Uh, Muslims made several important improvements to theory and construction of sundials, which they inherited from their Indian and Greek predecessors. Khwarizmi, remember him from the mathematics, he made tables for his instruments, which considerably shortened the time needed to make specific calculations. And sundials were frequently placed on mosques to determine the time of prayer. One of the most striking examples was built in the 14th century by the timekeeper of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Ibn al-Shatir. Uh, several forms of quadrant were also invented by the Muslims, and among them were the sign quadrant used for astronomical calculations. Various forms of uh, orrery quadrant used to determine time, especially the times of prayer, were also made, and these were um, worked out by the observations uh, of the sun or the stars. And a center of the development of quadrants was definitely 9th century Baghdad. Sadly, um, a lot of these um, sundials are now missing from uh, uh, mosques because, as I explained later, why the, um, the art of astronomy, if you like, was seen to be the work of the devil. So a lot of them are hidden away. They may still be there, but they're often hidden away. But Islamic astronomers also had access to complex observatories, usually furnished with a myriad of instruments, including very large examples of quadrants indeed, and very large sundials and armillaries. These were often funded by caliphs or rulers who wished to promote the study of science and elevate themselves in the eyes of people. Many eminent astronomers studied at these observatories. They lived and worked on the site and some observatories had their own living quarters, schools, hospitals, and mosques. Um, very much like the modern observatories we see today in places like Chile and, uh, and Hawaii and places like that, where the astronomers live on site for periods and they, they work on site. And uh, th this was done in the 10th century. Quite incredible. Now, the Maragé Observatory was an astronomical observatory established in 1259 AD under the patronage of Ilkhanid Huluga, Hula, sorry, Hulagu, and the directorship of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, a Persian scientist and astronomer. And it was located in the heights west of Maragé, which is today situated in East Azerbaijan province of Iran. This was once considered the most advanced scientific institution in the Eurasian world. And in fact, today, um, if you could get to uh, the province in Iran, which is uh, highly doubtful, but it is still there. It's been preserved. It's got a, a dome, a bit like um, the Eden Project type dome over the top of it. And you can go, you can go inside and outside you can see the bases for some of the instruments, some of the quadrants, etc. So it, it's been preserved, which is quite fantastic. In the 11th century, the Abbasid dynasty, which was the guardian of science, was already in decline. And the Islamic world splintered into several kingdoms. Religious intolerance started to entrench and scientific inquiry declined. With the beginning of the First Crusade began at the behest of Pope Urban II, many of the great libraries were destroyed and records burned. Some of the academics point to one man as the main reason for the decline of the Golden Age of Islam, and that man was Hamid al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali disdained the state of philosophy in the Muslim world, 
And in his 11th century document, The Incoherence of the Philosophers, Al-Ghazali refuted philosophy and science as lacking a foundation in Islam. The philosophers, he insisted, would be wrong as long as they undermined God's authority and denied basic Islamic beliefs with their questions and concepts. Nothing much has changed really, has it? Al-Ghazali believed that nothing could be known apart from God and Islam. He said that maths and science was the work of the devil. Furthermore, it was futile and wrong to believe otherwise because only God was powerful. Al-Ghazali's ideas unfortunately took hold and as a result philosophy sharply declined among Sunnis and constant warfare may have also played a role in a popular swear towards conservatism. But largely due to Al-Ghazali, the foundations of the Islamic Golden Age began to crumble and continued assaults by Mongols and Crusaders cemented the Golden Age's fate. And so the age that had advanced our knowledge of medicine, mathematics, science, and philosophy, that had given us algebra, trigonometry, named our stars and constellations, was gone, never to rise again as a scientific force. Since then, not one major invention or discovery has come from the Muslim world, although many Muslim scientists continue to advance science, but just not in the Middle East. So, that's my brief uh, history of the golden age of uh, Islamic astronomy. Thank you very much for watching. I'll, uh, I'll stop my share now and I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, Dave's got any. Okay, thanks very much, John. Excellent. So I'll throw it out to everyone else if you want to unmute yourself if you've got a question for John. Nobody. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would like to say, John, that was an absolutely tremendous talk, uh, full of stuff that I had no idea about. <laughs> so, uh, you filled in a huge blank for me. I, ha I have no questions, but I probably need to look into this area in more detail. But I, I just thought that was fantastic. It's, it's, a, fasc it's a fascinating subject, in fact. Yeah. One of the things I do is uh, uh, traveling around the world is I study what they call indigenous astronomy. So I study Aboriginal and Torres Strait people astronomy, Inuit astronomy. I give talks about these things. Um, and it's, it's always fascinating to study these, these uh, subjects and find out more about how different cultures uh, saw astronomy. Indeed. Yeah, surprising these things that you know, like algebra and where they originate from, you, yeah. know, you just don't realise, do you? That's right. Yeah. The history, because we sort of lose touch of where they come from. We do indeed. We do yeah. indeed. There are huge swathes of, <clears throat> of mathematics, um, which basically have come from that era, and they're the ones who brought it into the West. And if it wasn't for... And it was probably the fall of Constantinople, which then caused it to then get propagated further west, because that caused an awful lot of um, philosophers in Constantinople to be, become homeless and seek refuge in the west. Um, that, it's a very true. complex story. Yes, it is. That, that, that's it. that is very true. And also, um, as uh, the Muslim world spread out to uh, places in Asia, like China, for instance, the, um, the Chinese astronomers were very much influenced by Islamic astronomy. And of course, as the, uh, in the central belt of um, Islam at that time, Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, around the, those areas, as these were coming under um, the, the boots, if you like, a theological boot um, of, the, of these uh, mullahs, what happened was that, uh, as you quite rightly say, Ron, uh, a lot of these philosophers and a lot of the scientists, uh, mathematicians, philosophers moved out towards places like China and the West and, and took a lot of, a lot of the translation of Ptolemy's Almagest uh, actually came from the translations done by the Arabs. And as Copernicus, as you can see in Copernicus's writings, he took an, an awful lot from Al-Tusi and, uh, and people like that. Um, so it's so extremely important. Mm. 
Anybody else? One, one question I have is um, you, you, you talked about the large scale observatories that were, were built. Do you know what sort of accuracy and the, the, the instruments, you know, essentially the, the masonry instruments were, were, were capable of? Yeah, well, they, they, were, they were surprisingly accurate. You could get, some of them could get down to sort of like 10 arc seconds, and the, you know, uh, which for the time was incredible. Um, some of the larger observatories uh, were, were in, they, they, these were huge instruments. It took three or four different people to actually operate them, just to move the things around, you know, and uh, move the scales around. But just to think that they had the idea and could work things out like that is amazing. I mean, the, the talk about being able to imagine what the constellations would look like from space just blows my mind, to be honest. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I find it difficult to think of that. And it's, it's um, but you think somebody sat down in the ninth century or 10th century and did that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's quite staggering that somebody yeah. was able to, uh, you know, put themselves in a different position. Uh, um, and they were, and I have to say, they were remarkably accurate. Hmm. Yeah. So I think we're clever today, but uh, you know, with the resources they had then, the things they uh, found out and discovered were amazing. Well, it, it's a great shame. That, it's a great shame that a lot of this has been forgotten, um, because it does no service to the Islamic world. We have, we hear so much about the bad side of of religion these days, not just in Islam but other religions. And we forget that a lot of signs came from the, these religions, although we still suffer from um, the backlash from religions through, I mean, we, we have it today, creationists and everything else, don't we? But, um, but we, we shouldn't forget the, the work that was done by these people in the name of religion. You know, they, they, there, was, there was no scientific method as such then, so there was no science as such. Uh, but it was done because of religion, in the name of religion, and uh, and eventually it was religion that killed it. Yeah. You can no. tell I'm not religious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I think I have heard that um, in different countries in the world, um, R Ramadan has been declared to start at different times, but basically through the, the difficulty in detecting you know, the very first thin crescent moon. Yes, hmm. and it's also, they also base it on um, uh, when certain stars actually rise. And of course, that, that's a, one of the reasons that they used the astrolabes, etc., was to work all, all these things out. Um, it's quite, it is incredibly fascinating. It's, it's much the same, funnily enough, when you look at uh, Aboriginal astronomy in, in uh, Australia and New Zealand and places like that, where they, they also use the stars for uh, reasons other than just pure science, but um, in their everyday lives, for instance, to, to decide when uh, wild corn was ready to harvest or when uh, certain lizards would be, would be burrowing into the ground where they could be dug up for food, things like this. And um, if I could, don't mind me rambling on a bit about Aboriginal astronomy, Dave. Um, one of the fascinating things, you might, you might know this, you might not, I don't know if you do, but you can, you can actually do this yourself. Uh, if you look, the, the Aboriginals and Torres Strait people, island people had a thing called song lines. And basically what they would do, they would, they would map out routes to get from one place to another on walkabout. Uh, and usually it'd be to a place where they could get food, where, for instance, wild corn would be growing. And in Queensland, what we now know as Queensland, the, the state there in, in Australia, um, they had roots that they would use. Now, for centuries and centuries and centuries, they used the same roots. And they passed on that information in song lines. So basically, these are stories that are told through uh, a type of song. And that told them where certain stars were, for instance, the, when, when the Pleiades would be in the, in, the, in the night sky. And they would follow these routes. Now, obviously, over centuries, these routes created pathways in the ground. 
when the uh, Western uh, invaders uh, arrived in Australia, they wanted to transport their wagons and horses, and they found that these pathways were, in fact, um, very well established. So they just used those, and that widened the, the pathways into uh, fundamental roads, if you like. Um, later, when uh, modern times came, they were building highways. And again, these were the quickest points between, two, between A and B. They were the mapped out uh, routes, accepted routes. So they built highways. And in fact, the highways of Queensland, you can actually do this. If you get Stellarium and a map of Queensland on Google Earth, are mapped to the stars. The highways of Queensland are actually mapped to the stars. You can bring the stars right down onto some of the highways of Queensland, and it actually maps the route out in a series of stars in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's quite, I mean, there's been a lot, quite a lot of work done in, in uh, Australia on this in indigenous astronomy. But even people in Queensland don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Are they named after stars as well, the streets? No, they're not, no. They're not highway not. 1 and Highway 10. <laughs> no. Well, we've got the M1. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I've got M31, though. <laughs> well, have we? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, fascinating. Hi, David. Fascinating. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, Hi, Dave. First of all, apologies for being late. Uh, family crisis at uh, one of the hospitals. Um, oh, yes, so I've just come in now. Everything's okay otherwise. Um, Good. I've obviously missed the first uh, part of this. Uh, Hi, John. Uh, we chat uh, on Facebook quite a lot, lot there, and I can see Julian and Ron. Hi, Ron. Um, you, you just mentioned about the, the mapping of the, the Milky Way and the stars you know, looking down um, in the Aboriginal um, view. Isn't that also what was said about the Egyptians with the pyramids being lined up with the stars of Orion and the Milky Way as the River Nile? Um, I was never really that way, uh, you know, enthusiastic about that. But uh, was it Hancock? Was there the UFO conspiracies and all that? Oh, my God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that, actually, that was the, the thing at the time. The pyramids is, is, is an interesting one because there is some truth in yeah. the fact that they, they did quite often align monuments with the stars like Orion's belt, for instance. But I'm pretty sure, I don't know if anybody can correct me on this, I'm pretty sure that um, given at the time the pyramids were built um, the, in procession, the stars would have been in a, different, a bit of a different place and, and the pyramids are actually the wrong way around. That's what I thought, yeah. Uh, so, so you got Hancock's an idiot anyway, so... <laughs> you know. The, <laughs> we won't argue over that. <laughs> the Egyptians did use the heliac horizon of Sirius, though, didn't they, to predict the yep. flooding of the Nile? Yeah, that's yeah. a well documented, I think, yeah. that one. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think it wasn't the the Sphinx was built before the the, the Great Pyramids, you know, the, the Giza. Um, so the, the the Sphinx is older and it's facing towards the get this right. I think it's towards the east, watching Leo would be rising with procession. It would have been oriented oriented correctly. So, yeah, there's yeah. things like that which makes you think, well, you know, they must have had some great knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder, well, what, what have we lost? Well, you said before I, about religion brought a lot in, but what have we lost? Certainly over the last decade or two with uh, politics, religion, and all these clashes that we had in the Middle East, um, you know, monuments getting destroyed, uh, you know, blown, blown up and that. What, what have we lost over the eons? I, I just, you know, uh, the information that we must have lost is mind-boggling, it really is. Well, I think, fortunately, in modern times, we've gained that knowledge back again, I, I think, yeah. to a great extent. But what worries me in this modern time is the attack now currently happening on science. We're seeing it in just with this COVID uh, pandemic. Yeah. And we're yeah. seeing world, world leaders, um, some of whom we don't, won't name Trump. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who... Them. who who blatantly, mm. and we've got, we've got people in our own government, for instance, who, who say don't listen to the experts, you know, and it's, uh, mm. it's madness. And what worries me is that if this takes any hold at all, fortunately, I think I know enough um, very, very good scientists who I'm quite sure uh, will fight back and not let this happen. And I hope to hell they do, because um, it, it, it's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. Mm. Okay, any other questions, folks? You're very quiet, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Something I know nothing about, so I've been listening uh, <laughs> with fascination. 
cake. No, no cake was involved. No cake was involved. <laughs> no cakes were involved in this. I knew there was something I forgot. I forgot to bring bloody cake. That was it. <laughs> next time. Next time. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, John. That's been absolutely fascinating. What a wonderful talk that's been. Thanks for having me. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, so if you've got any ideas, what would you like us to discuss, talk about next Tuesday? If Sean's, we're going to put Sean off. Okay, Sean, to, until Nick does his talk on nebulae, and then you can show oh, yeah. your images yeah. of nebulae after Nick's talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that would be would good. That work? Yeah. That'd be better, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Okay, because that would yeah. be less of a rush for you if you're coming back that day. Yeah. Sean can show me up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so any ideas of what you'd like us to cover next Tuesday? Uh, Rachel, <laughs> go on, any what? ideas? Any yeah. ideas? Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the spot already. Look. <laughs> well, has anybody been observing Saturn and Jupiter? Nick, I was just yeah. about to suggest that, something on observing Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so planets? Hmm. Yeah, we, 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 we got... We opposition of Mars coming up is it October yes yeah so I've got some prep work on that what can we expect um, yeah, some exciting stuff yeah. coming coming with that I've been asked to do yeah. see if I can join in the live streaming of images through the telescope yeah. see oh, some great oh, images from there uh, so that's going to be yeah. really exciting to get involved so, in that Pete Lawrence is bringing some images in and Damien Peach and others some good stuff yeah best in my lifetime I think this one Unless I'm very lucky. I think this is the last one for most of us. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's be fair. <laughs> well, 2030 <laughs> something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's surprising how, if you get up early enough, um, it's surprising how high it actually is. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, it's good um, I, did, I didn't wait till it was at its best the other night because by half, what, quarter past half three, I was absolutely shattered. Mm. So I could have yeah. stayed out probably about yeah. another half an hour more and it would have been even higher. There's some cracking so, images coming through. I mean, there yeah. really are some super stuff coming through. David RDT has been doing yeah. stuff. Martin, yeah, Martin, been really Lewis, good. Uh, Martin Lewis too. Yeah. yeah so. I just need to improve my imaging and uh, see if I can get that a bit better. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll do it. I'm, I'll do it, yeah. Especially as it gets bigger, it gets a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, what about um, this uh, method where you... Uh, I, I'm just trying to remember the term for the, 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 the gadget, uh, you know, for... Um, bringing the red and blues together. Yeah, oh, well, the um, dispersion corrector. ADC. Uh, that's the one. Yes, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we did mention that a few weeks ago, didn't we? When yeah. We talked yeah, about planetary imaging. Um, yeah. yeah, I can do a little bit on that as well if people Be want interesting. to pressure. Because that, that'll work visually and also yes. with with imaging oh, yeah, as yeah. well. So Yeah, it works visually too. Of yeah, course, yeah. Mars, you've got a decent altitude, so it's a good chance you get good results. Um, Saturn and Jupiter still low down on the even at the best, yeah. You know, for us, yeah. so but it, again, that might help. <laughs> but these, these gadgets are you know, it's a gadget, and yeah, and of course, don't forget, cheap, cheap colored <laughs> not filters, <wrong> with gadgets, <laughs> cheap colored filters also help as well, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if you're if you're restricting it down to a, um, a sort of restricting the wavelengths, then obviously there's yeah. less yeah. dispersion to occur, so you will get a sharper image. Yeah, I'll I, I just say, uh, I think Ron is still on camera, is he? Somewhere? Yeah, Ron's still there. Ron's just sort of coming back into the field, aren't you, Ron, with astronomy? And you've got your telescope set up again and you're doing any, some imaging. Any news on your delivery, Ron? No, you're, you're still muted. You're muted, Ron. No, you're muted, Ron. I can't hear you. <laughs> I managed to unmute oh, me and then mute me. <laughs> oh dear, I blame my age. Um, I had a package from Flo today which had um, the bits, so I've got, I've got useful things like batting off masks and a um, guide yeah. camera. Right. Um, unfortunately, the little thing called a telescope <sighs> is somewhere. <laughs> okay. It's still about a month away, I think. Right. She okay. told me I live about half a mile from Flo. <laughs> Give him a knock. <laughs> knock on the door. Say, "Come on, get your act together." Yeah, I, do. I, I live half a mile away from there. there. Yeah. I had a chat with them online last week, and they said still about about the end of the month. Yeah. So, what yeah, what I mean, optics are you? 
I've had a 15 year break from astronomy completely, mm. but I've not done any observing really since the 1980s. Mm. Wow. Uh, the stars so me were getting out with my camera last weekend, you know, that's progress. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. image behind me is one of Fridays. Yeah, you've got some oh. nice Milky Way shots there. Yeah. Is it a good sky where you are, Ron? It's Bortle Class 4 here. Okay, yeah. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, so this is just yeah. out, that was just out the back garden. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Very nice. Good. Cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Dave, can I just can I just remind everyone that um, if you if you have got clouds tonight and you can't get out and see the Perseids, that um, the UK Meteor Monitoring Network, of which mm. my observatory that I'm sitting in at the moment is part of it, and I've got the cameras outside here looking up, and uh, we've got a live uh, website where we we upload live images as they come in. I'll send a message to everyone now with oh, the link. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. yeah, so, so if, you, if, you, if, you, if it's cloudy, have a look there and you'll see the images come up. We've got 29 stations around the UK with uh, multiple cameras in some of the stations. And uh, basically how it works is it, as soon as the image is, is captured, it's uploaded to the website and you can see around your area where there's any meteors or fireballs or whatever. So does the software goes out automatically, John? It's, it's, all, it's all automatic, yeah. It's so all you, automatic. You managed to get triangulation from that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we can, we can work out. We do analysis on all the data we collect. Um, we we have hundreds of thousands of, of hits over the year, and we we do analysis and we get orbital data. We can work out which showers they come from, whether they're sporadic or whether from a particular comet. Um, and we can we got, we also work out the orbital the orbital um, path. And we can we we can provide the graphs and images for that as well, so it's, it's fascinating stuff. Fantastic! Oh, so get yourself on the UK Meteor Network then, and watch yep. the live feed if you've got yeah. cloud. Have a view. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Good. Okay, excellent. So we got a bit of a basis for next week. We'll show some of your great images. So keep putting them up on the Padlet, and. Uh, We'll show some of those again next week. And if you've got any images to show, I know Roger's probably got some more by then. You can show us. Yes, you will. He's out tonight, aren't you? We're saying. Oh, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so brilliant. Okay. So, you know what we're going to say, folks. <laughs> Thanks so much again, John. Fascinating talk. Pleasure. Lovely Thanks. delivery as well. Absolutely fantastic. So, uh, good luck, Roger, when you're out and Sandy tonight and everybody else who's out observing meteors all the planets and uh keep safe keep well and thank you very much keep looking up <laughs> have a good week folks. Bye. 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 bye cheers everyone bye good luck roger not good. Not good weather eh?